Here we go. All right. Today's scripture reading of God's Word is John 12, 23 to 24. Jesus replied, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it will remain only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. So be it. spirit that brings that word alive to us, that puts a new melody in our heart. Lord, we pray today that you do make us broken so that we can be strong in the spirit. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So is he your one heart's desire, as that song says? You know, then the next thing is make me broken. That's kind of what the scripture said also. That if we want to learn to truly live, that maybe we need to consider dying first. But that's a hard concept. So this message is called, Unless a Kernel of Wheat. And we probably will get into that more next week if that's the direction the Lord takes us. Because I had to study about wheat and all this, and I'm thinking that's not really where the focus is so much today, so we won't get there. But I even had to, you know, is it a kernel? Is it a grain? Is it a seed? But it's, it's a kernel in wheat, okay? And we can argue that later if you want to, but, but that's what I come up with. And I started studying Luke, so that's why I'm in John. Go figure. <laughs> Luke's primary audience was those who said they believe. Because he wrote and said, I wrote this letter so that you might know what you believe. See, John wrote his letter so that you might believe. Now you see how I went from Luke to John? Here's what Luke says in the first four verses of his letter of his first letter. Luke 1, verses 1 through 4. Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us. Fulfilled, they are a fact. Just as they were handed down to us by those who were first eyewitnesses and servants. Don't miss that word. And servants of the word. With this in mind, since I myself have carefully invested every, investigated everything from the beginning... All the way back, Luke investigated everything for us. So I too decided to write an orderly account for you. And remember, he puts that in, not in chronological order, but in order for us to understand what our calling is, what Jesus' ministry was, the, the things that Jesus taught about the kingdom of God coming to earth. I decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theopolis. Now, here's where it's funny. We don't know who Theopolis is. Does it matter? We can study and try to figure out that whether it's a kernel or a grain or whatever. But what's so interesting about Theopolis is it means friend or lover of God. That's what the name literally means. So maybe he was writing to a distinct person. Maybe he wasn't. But he should be writing to you if you're a lover of God, if he is your one heart's desire. I wrote an orderly account for you, most excellent Theopolis, so that you may know the certainty of the things that you have been taught, so that you can live that life, that you can know without a shadow of doubt all the promises of God, that you can understand His commandments and why they're important to you since, let's see, you were created in the first place, right? To get, bring God glory and honor. And with this new life that you've been given, with the Spirit that empowers you, you can understand and live this life fully equipped. So there are no excuses. We're all called for that great commission to spread the gospel message, to be a part of the body of Christ, to proclaim the glory of God. 
to let our light shine before men that they may see our good deeds and glorify our God who is in heaven. So like I said, reading Luke, stu- starting studying out, I'm like, okay, i got to go to John first, and I don't even know what took me there, but th- the Spirit took me there for sure. Luke writes about the kingdom of heaven and how disciples should live and act and know that with certainty. So like I said, John writes so that we might believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that He is the promised Messiah, that He should be our Master and Lord if we truly believe. So the first question I have for you today is, do you believe? And if you believe, then you have decided to follow in the footsteps of Jesus, to follow after Him with your heart, with your actions, with your mind, to love the Lord with all your mind, body, soul, strength, heart, everything to lay yourself on the altar as a living sacrifice. Or maybe you don't believe. So Luke wrote his gospel to those that John had already wrote about believing. Does that make sense where where I went? So in the gospel of John, I started on this kernel of wheat falling to the ground and what that means. And I had to look back and and see what John was writing to understand this point that has come up to. And it happens to come up to this point where it was right where I left off preaching before Mother's Day or on Mother's Day. Go figure that God would put me right back to that point because He directs our steps. And as I'm reading John, I am reminded, and I put them in your bulletin, about the seven I am statements of Jesus because you need to look at these in context of what Jesus is saying here. And these are outlandish statements that Jesus is making to those who say that they want to follow after Him, that say they recognize Him as the Messiah, that say they believe. But do they believe? Have they put their faith, trust, and confidence in Jesus Christ and who He says He is? Because here's what he sa- who, who He says He is. I am the bread of life. Now, I'm not going to discuss much about these today. You've got them. You can go back and look at them, and and we probably will preach on them at whatever point that God directs us to do that. But He says, I am the bread of life. And if you remember in John chapter 6, that's a pivotal point, and I'll talk about it more in a second. He goes on to say, I am the light of the world in John chapter 8. In John chapter 10, He says, I am the gate. And right after that, He says, I am the good shepherd. In John chapter 11, he says, I am the resurrection and the life. Now notice our scripture falls right here. We'll talk more about that in a second. Then he goes on to say, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and I am the vine. In John 14 and then John 15. So back to his first statement, I am the bread of life. This is the first outlandish statement that he makes about who he is. It's in John chapter 6. And then in verse 66 of that chapter, we see that many depart from Him. Because they say, this is tough teaching, I can't take this. Jesus has just fed 5,000 people, 5,000 men. So He's fed 13,000 people, give or take. And He tells them that I want a relationship with you. Get that. That Jesus wants a relationship with you. Why? Because God created you to be in a relationship with Him. Not just to know Him. If you're just trying to know about God and know about Jesus, then you don't have a relationship with Him. My dad will be here in a few hours. I'm excited. I call him Daddy. None of you can call him that. You might know the man, but I call him Daddy because I have a relationship with him. Even though I don't see him that often, it's been over a year since I've seen him. No, we saw him last year on his birthday. Um, So it's been a little over a year since I've seen him, but I have a relationship with him that you guys don't understand because he's not your daddy. Now think about that when you're talking about God and you're talking about Jesus and you're talking about the Spirit. Ooh, the Spirit also. That you're supposed to have a relationship and the Spirit is what actually gives you that relationship. When you're really having a relationship with God through Jesus, you don't even realize the presence of the Holy Spirit because He's not proclaiming Himself. He's proclaiming Jesus who's proclaiming God. See how that whole thing works? 
that triune deity that, that we call Father, because we have the Spirit in us. So Jesus says, I want to have a relationship with you. And that requires me being Lord. I am the bread of life. You've got to eat from me. You've got to want to consume me, to learn about me, so that you can learn about the Father. If you want to be my disciple, which has already been talked about in John, Jesus said, come, follow after me. I will make you fishers of men. That that's our calling. Above all other things, once that we're saved, is to tell others about the joy that is within us, the peace that we have that surpasses all understanding. What our loving God did for us through Jesus Christ. Because in this world, there's a world of hurting. There's another school shooting this week. You know that. People are hurting and they're looking for answers. But they're not going to find them unless you point them to God. They might not read His Word, but they will see what you do, your actions that you do, and it will either glorify your Father in heaven or glorify the devil. You can't serve two masters. So in John chapter 6 and verse 53, Jesus said to them, this is soon after he said the statement of I am the bread of life. He says, Very truly I tell you, again that means listen up, I've got something important to tell you. Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink His blood, you have no life in you. What an awkward statement. About as awkward as this kernel of wheat falling to the ground, right? <laughs> what does this mean? But he's saying, unless you devour me, my teachings, my commands, and they're not commands that are burdensome. They're because, again, I was there in your creation, designing you, knitting you in your mother's womb. I know how you function, the hole in your heart that only I can supply to fill that hole so that you can worship and honor God and be in the relationship that you were created to be, especially in the relationship that you're given new birth to. We skip down to verse 60. It says, On hearing this, many of His disciples said, This is a hard teaching. It doesn't say many of the people. It says many of the disciples. Those who had forsook all and followed after Jesus Christ. That they understood that He was the Messiah, the promised one. That He was the Savior of the world. That He was their teacher, their rabbi, their master, and their Lord. But they said, This is a hard teaching. So was He really those things to them? Did they have head knowledge but not heart knowledge? And then they went on to say, Who can accept it? Aware that His disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said to them, Does this offend you? Then what if you see the Son of Man ascending to where He was before? Because He came from heaven. He's going to go back there. He is the Son of God, whether you truly believe it and will follow after Him or not. The Spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you, they are full of Spirit and life. Because again, you were created and designed and born again if you are a true believer by the Spirit of God to be in a relationship with Him so that you can understand Jesus Christ and be in a relationship with God. It all ties together again. But then in verse 66... Verse 66 we read, from this time many of His disciples turned back and no longer followed Him. John doesn't change the text and put a different word. He still puts disciples. Because see, they still proclaimed, I believe, I believe. And then we have that verse that says, not everyone who cries, Lord, Lord. Because see, you've got to be in a relationship with Jesus Christ. And like the song said, if you're yearning and desiring to do that, sometimes you've got to be broken. Sometimes a, a, a kernel of wheat needs to fall to the ground to die. Verse 67 says, You don't want to leave me too, do you? Jesus asked the twelve. Those that had forsaken all to follow after Him. And He even asked them, He says, Do you want to leave me also? Are you going to leave me? Simon Peter answered him and said, Lord, there's the first good thing, Lord, he knew he was Lord, to whom shall we go? They could have went back to their fishing jobs, anything else. 
You know, what do you think about when things are tough? Even just, just use it in your marriage or your children or anything else. What do you think about when things get tough? I can throw in the towel. I can do this or that. They could have said we can go back. That wasn't something that, that they could not do. But he said, where shall we go? Why? Because you have the words of eternal life. If we walk away, we're condemning ourselves to eternal damnation. That's what he's saying. So why would we do that? I don't care what you do, I'm going to follow you. And the thing is that I can't do that again unless I draw on the power of the Spirit. So we see another reason that Jesus said, I must go away so that the Spirit can come, so that you can be empowered to live this life. Verse 69, we have come to believe. Now they knew what believe meant because they put their trust and faith in God. And we see they still really don't know at this point because they're still back and forth, back and forth till the power of the Spirit comes upon them again. And they go out and be His witness and the church explodes. We have come to believe and to know. Isn't that the words that Luke writes? So that you'll know with certainty. Know what? That you are the Holy One of God. You are the one. There is no other way, no other truth, no other life. You are the one. All of the I am statements are true in Jesus, even though He's only made one statement so far. In chapter 7 we see that disciples leave for Jerusalem for the, feast, for the festival of tabernacles, which is a celebration of the Israelites and God's gracious provisions that He has given the Israelites through all the years. But yet, most of them are blind to this most gracious provision that has come into the world, the Messiah. Because later we're going to read that they say, crucify Him, crucify Him. Jesus begins teaching. And on the last and greatest day of the festival, which I've talked about before, Jesus stood up and He yelled in John 7 verse 37. It says, on the last and greatest day of the festival, at the pivotal point, he says, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. When they've got the water in their hand, prepared to pour it, Jesus says, I am the water that brings life. He goes on to say what he was taught to the Samaritan woman at the well, which she didn't understand, that I am the water so that you may worship in spirit and in truth, because that time has come and will only come through me. Whoever believes in me, verse 38, as Scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. All through the power of the Spirit. All becoming that kernel of wheat and dying so that the Spirit might live through you. By this He meant the Spirit, whom those who believed in Him were later to receive. Up to that time the Spirit had not been given since Jesus had not yet been glorified. Now let me say right here, you didn't have to wait for the Spirit. <laughs> when you accepted Jesus Christ, you were born again by the Spirit of God. How blessed you are by God. But yet sometimes maybe it's better to wait and anticipate so we can realize what we do get when we really get it. But God gave us the Spirit immediately to equip you and I to be the church. No delay whatsoever. In Acts 1.8, when he says that you will be my witnesses, he tells them to go home and wait till the Holy Spirit comes. They're, they're all ready for the mission and everything, but he says, go home, pray, and wait. And if you read, they, they're in prayer, and they're of one mind and one accord. And then the Spirit comes on them, and they act. They go and make disciples, just as they were commissioned to do. Verse 40 of John 7, On hearing his words, some of the people said, Surely this man is a prophet. Others said, He is the Messiah. Still others asked, How can the Messiah come from Galilee? Now which one are you saying? Are there doubts? That's why Luke wrote his, his uh, gospel, so that you would know with certainty, so you wouldn't have those doubts. So that you could see what orderly... Uh, writing that he would present to understand Jesus' teachings even more through the power of the Spirit again. So who do you say Jesus is? Have you put your faith and trust in Him? Are you His disciple? 
Or are you his disciple in word rather than word and action? Are you following in his footsteps, obeying his commands, and living as the hands and feet of Christ, which all of these are teachings of Jesus that you should be doing if you in fact believe these statements, if you believe that Jesus is the Messiah? Jesus goes on to say, I am the light of the world in John 8. He says, I am the gate in John 10. I am the good shepherd in John 10. I am the resurrection and the life in John 11. Now we're getting up to where we were before Mother's Day a little bit. Jesus made this statement to a disciple named Martha, a woman. <laughs> in John eleven twenty five. 25, and the reason I'm laughing on hmm is not that women, we just went through Mother's Day. And I said how important the women were in Jesus' ministry. So you don't realize why I said that. Because they were the ones who literally financed Jesus and His disciples. And like I said, as a man, I can understand that a little bit. I, had, I would be humbled to know that the women provided for me. Because see, men, we think we've got to provide a, a living for our families and everything. And so many times lose focus on the fact that we're the spiritual leader of our household as well. In John eleven twenty five, 25, Jesus said to her, to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Do you? That's what I mean. He asked that question so that you think about and say, where am I in this relationship? Here's a reply in verse 27. Yes, Lord, same as Peter, Lord. She replied, I believe that you are what? The Messiah. The one that has been promised that you are fulfilling all of these things, that you are the Son of God, the Savior of the world. <clears throat> then Jesus goes on to raise Lazarus from the dead. Wow, what a pivotal... Uh, Sign, as John says, signs that you may believe. Jesus raised a man that Scripture says stinketh because he'd been in the grave so long. Back to life. And he's walking around as a witness. And you see him everywhere that he goes in town. Because this man was dead. Everybody knew it. But now he has life again. <clears throat> Many believe as a result but not the religious leaders of the time. They desired even more and plotted even more to kill Jesus. So now we're into John chapter 12 when there's a feast being prepared, a, a, a party in Jesus' honor and Lazarus. Mary and Martha are there worshiping in their own way and Lazarus is reclining back at the table telling the story, yeah, I was dead and I'm alive now. Jesus, it's all because of Jesus. And then we get into... Jesus coming into Jerusalem and the people recognize Him as the promised Messiah. And they say, Hosanna, save us. Because they think the time is coming when Jesus is going to deliver Israel from Roman captivity and set up His kingdom. But see, since Jesus didn't work exactly that way, since we need to repent and change our way of thinking, turn our thinking upside down, literally, they denied Him. And later they said, crucify Him, crucify Him. So let's read the verses just prior to what Merle read this morning. I'm in John chapter 12, starting in verse 17. Now the crowd that was with Him, when He called Lazarus from the tomb and raised Him from the dead, continued to spread the word. The gospel message is going along. Jesus' ministry is, is, is continuing. Many people, because they had heard that He had performed this sign, the raising of Lazarus from the dead, because He performed many, many signs, but John wrote this now, and this happened in, in sequence, because Jesus had hit this pivotal point that He had the power over death, because He would soon lay down His life and be able to raise it up again. 
They went out to meet him. Verse 19, So the Pharisees said to one another, See, these, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. And if you study that too, it doesn't just mean Israel. It means the entire world like it says. If we don't do something before long, the whole world is going to believe in Jesus is what they said. This is where I left off at Easter if you don't remember that. Verse 20, Now, at that same time, whether it was exactly at that time or the day following, you can look in commentary, stuff so doesn't matter. John writes now because he's tying that together. Tied together to what just happened, this, fest, this feast in Jesus' honor, it's Passover. Jesus comes into Jerusalem as the King of kings and Lord of lords, and the people recognize it. But Satan wants to steal your worship. And he does it through the religious leaders at the time that say he's not really the Messiah. He might be one sent by God and everything, but he's not God himself. Even though he raised Lazarus from the dead. Now at that time there were some Greeks among those who went up to the worship at the festival. Now when I first read this, I was like, what do the Greeks have to do with anything? Why did John write this? It's just strange. Well, you need to study your scripture so that you understand more. Read the whole story. The Greeks were the... Oh, wait a minute. We're studying Corinthians, aren't we? Corinth is in Greece. Ha! The Greeks were the philosophical, philosophical people of the world. I know I just butchered that. Philosophical. Thank you. People of the world. The way to get to heaven and to have eternal life and everything is through what we tell you, man's wisdom. Not this foolishness of the cross that you're going to hear about soon. We are intellectually, oh, man is on the throne rather than God. We have the way, the truth, and the life. <laughs> no, they don't. It's no coincidence that the Greeks are brought in here. Oh, well, let's think about something else too. Who came originally when they saw the star in the sky? Wise, philosophical, I get it right? Men from the east came to see this baby that was born. It took them one to two years to get there if you read Scripture. They traveled that far to find a toddler. And when he, they got there, they worshipped Him, Scripture says. Now there are wise philosophical men coming from the West at Jesus' death. Huh, that's really neat. That, that's something that's just a coincidence, isn't it? <laughs> John 7, 37 said, On the last day of the festival, Jesus stood up and said in a loud voice, Anyone who is thirsty, come to me and drink. Don't forget that. That's why I threw that in there, even though it's not an I am statement. John is telling you all along, you've got to go after Jesus and be in a relationship from Him. You've got to consume Him. He is the bread and He is the drink. Just prior to that, John wrote in verse 35, The Jews said to one another... Where did this man intend to go that we cannot find him? Will he go where our people live scattered among the Greeks? Putting it all together for us so we can understand, so that we might believe. So that when we read Luke's writing, that we might understand what we believe so that we can live it. <clears throat> Will he go where our people live scattered among the Greeks and teach the Greeks? Yes, salvation comes to everyone who believes. What did he mean when he said, you will, you will look for me, but you will not find me, and where I am you cannot come? On the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood up and in a loud voice said, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Now back to our scripture in John 12. Now there were some Greeks. See how we got here? Among those who were, went up to what? Worship at the festival. Not just to, to see what's going on, but they came to worship at the festival. 
They came to Philip, verse 21, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee with a request. Sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. Now if they came to worship God, why did they want to just see Jesus? Does that imply more? Does that imply they wanted to learn about Jesus and be in a relationship with Jesus? I think so. They didn't travel that far. If you look on a map, it's a good ways from Greece to Israel. And they had to do it by boat or by foot. It was a, quite a journey for them to come. But they came to see Jesus and worship Jesus. Philip went to tell Andrew, and Andrew and Philip in turn told Jesus. So let me remind you again of the statements, the first five statements that we went through. Well, now we're to statement six that's going to come up after here, right? Where Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And then the seventh statement, I am the vine. The first five statements are leading us up to this point again, that we know who Jesus is, that He is the bread of life, the light of the world, the gate, the good shepherd, the resurrection and the life, because what's going to happen right here? So that when this point comes, when we see Jesus crucified and risen again, that we'll know that He is the only way, the truth and the life. And we'll know that He's in the vine and the only way that we're going to have life is to cling to the vine rather than cling to our own life. To cling to the Spirit that He gave us. Now see where John puts this right in here? Whether it's in chronological order or not order, it's in God's order regardless. He's telling this story so that you may believe. Can you imagine the amount of people at that Passover? There were people from all over the world. And people came to see Jesus because they had heard, the Messiah has come. Could this be true? We've got to find out for ourselves. Even the Greeks, the philosophers, the educated of the world were there. Think about that. That's, that's the setting. Those who have ears, let them hear the next verse. John 12, 23. Jesus replied to all this setting that you're seeing going on. They're waiting for these words of how He's going to set up His kingdom. And Jesus replied, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. All right. Israel's going to be set free from this Roman oppression the darkness that's been over so long in our, in our nation is going to be taken away. Verse 24. Listen up. Don't miss this one. Very truly I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. What? Is that what you got when you read it? What? Where is Jesus going? Has He lost His mind again like He did back in John chapter 6 when He said He was the bread of life? Or is He telling us more about it? He goes on to say, But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Now, what are the seeds used for? They're used for food. They're also used for planting again. We'll go into that more in depth later. But once the seed dies, is willing to die, it produces you can't produce unless you're tied into the vine through the way, the truth, and the life. It's impossible. It's called religion otherwise rather than Savior and Lord. I don't even want to use the term Christianity because Christian means like Jesus or little Christ. And so many times that's not true of Christianity. So Jesus called His followers disciples. So I go back to that again. Are you His disciple? He also called them brothers because they knew Him. They were in a relationship with Him. I know that Jesus is talking about His death here. But there's the one little statement, it's time for the, man of, the Son of Man to be glorified. He's going to the cross. Is that what He means? Does He also mean that it's time for me to be glorified through you? It's better for me to leave. The Spirit comes upon you so that you will do even greater works than I've done. Could He be really speaking to those who truly believe? 
Could this be the start of their instruction so that they can go and tell the world? So that they can understand the great commission that has been given them? John 6, 66 said, On hearing it, many of His disciples said, This is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? Do you accept it? Is He saying that for you to truly live, you have to die to yourself. You have to die to your way of thinking. You have to take yourself off the throne and put me on the throne. Is that what he's saying? <laughs> read all of John. Read all of Luke. Just go look at the I am statements. Yes, that is what he's saying emphatically. He's saying, I am going to do this so that you may live and bring glory and honor to the Father which you were created and designed to do in the first place. I'm going to send the Spirit, which He said in John chapter 3, unless you're born again by the Spirit, you won't see, you won't enter heaven, let alone even see it. You must be born again. Which implies dying again so that you can have new life. Think about what happens next. The next chapter is John chapter 13. He desires to eat the Passover meal with them. He sits down with his closest intimate followers, the twelve. And there's Judas in his midst too. There's other people there also. But these are his core followers that say yes. And still there are some, at least one, that will turn back. And he says by washing their feet, by being a humble servant, He says, this is the example I am giving you to follow. To humbly submit yourself into service for God, for me, just as I have done and set the example for you. And then in John chapter 14, He says, don't worry, I'm going away, but I'm sending the Holy Spirit. And He gives them the, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Don't worry at all. You're fully equipped. This is God's plan. And you're a part of it. Now don't miss out. The way, the truth, and the life, right? Jesus is the way to God. The way to follow Him also. The way to be empowered to live that life. He is the truth. You're going to get Greeks and everything else in this world telling you differently. But Jesus is the truth. There aren't multiple truths. He is the truth. And He is the only way for eternal life. And that you should be comforted. And know that right here is when He said, I'm sending the Spirit. So you're not going out of a relationship with Me. You're going into an even deeper relationship with Me. Because here I've walked beside of you, but now the Spirit of God Himself is going to come in and the Lord is going to sanctify you by His Spirit and by the truth, both which reveal Jesus, which reveal God. And then in chapter 15, He says, I am the vine. Boy, see how all that flows? You can't have any life unless that kernel of wheat dies. You can't have any life unless you cling to the vine. And what are you supposed to do when you cling to the vine? But produce fruit. You have a purpose. You were created intentionally by God with a purpose to bring Him glory and honor. And now that Jesus Christ has come and empowered you with His Spirit, you have a calling even more to produce fruit, to tell people of the, of the good news of Jesus Christ. Wow, what a privilege we have as the church tied together by the Spirit of God to proclaim His Word. Things that the Old Testament prophets would have said, Wow! They have the Spirit of God. Things that the twelve would have said, They didn't even have to wait! When they believed, the Spirit of God came upon them. So what are you doing with that? How are you living your life? Unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies. That wasn't all that Jesus' reply to the Greeks and to the rest of the world was though. 
Verse 25 says, anyone who loves their life will lose it. While, at the same time, anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Two huge promises for those who believe. And here's the, here we go on to verse 26, say, Whoever serves me, and if you came to the community service, that same word that I mentioned there is used here, which worship is twofold. It means your body posture to who you're reverent to, to lay prostrate, in front of your God in humble submission. I said prostate Wednesday, just so you know. (laughs) To lay prostrate before your God, knowing who He is. And then it also involves a second part, and different words show that, your acts of service to your God. Now in the Old Testament, Jesus hadn't come, hadn't given His Spirit. In the New Testament, where we are, the church, He has given His Spirit so that you will be my witnesses, so that you will bear much fruit. Whoever serves me must follow with me, join with my cause, my campaign, continue on my work, learn from me the master, the teacher, the rabbi. And where I am, my servant, that word again, also will be. My father will honor Oh, well, that takes us back to Mother's Day. If you weren't here Mother's Day, honor means to make heavy. Now that's what it means in the Old Testament. New Testament's a little different. And what I mean by make heavy means its value. The more something had weight, the more value it has. So it says honor your father and mother. Make them heavy in value to you. The word is similar in the New Testament. And it's saying because of the great value that you see and what God has done for you through saving you through Jesus Christ, because you see that value, where I am my servant also will be and my Father will honor, fix a value as His child, as His beloved, priceless, on the one who serves me. Wow. And all this, the people were expecting a battle campaign to overthrow Caesar. Instead, Jesus said, I'm going to die with one verse and four more verses. He said, you need to follow me, which is what I've been telling you from the beginning. If you want to be fishers of men, if you want to truly be my disciple, then you've got to die so that you can live to serve me. You've got to embrace the Spirit so that you can understand and be sanctified as it is God's will that you be sanctified. Are you truly wise? What does the message of the cross mean to you? Because Jesus says to take up your cross and follow after Him. Or are you saying you're a disciple but these teachings are hard and maybe even foolish. Is Jesus your master and your Lord? Because if He's not your master and your Lord, there's a good possibility He's not your Savior. Those words aren't mine. Those are Jesus's through and through. They may be offensive. But Jesus said, does this teaching offend you? And the reason He said it is to draw you to Him. Because He said... You will make me Lord if you truly believe in me. You will follow after me. Where I am, there my servant is also. Now here's the great thing. Today is the day, no matter where you are in your relationship with with Christ, with God, with the Spirit, that you can cry out and say, make me broken so I can be healed. So that I can live. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your words. We thank you for your faithfulness, for your love, that you would send your only son to die for us, that we might live. We thank you for the eternal life that we are given through Jesus Christ our Lord. And Father, may we realize the precious gift, the honor that we've been given as your child to live in the kingdom of God here on earth and forevermore. Sanctify us by your truth and by your spirit, Father to be 
the light of the world that we need to be. To not be confused, to not let Satan get one single foothold in our life. And may we bind ourselves together with the Spirit to be the body of Christ, to spur one another to good works, that we may be of one mind, one accord, and that we may be the hands and feet of Jesus Christ in this world. We thank You and praise You for the freedom that we have. Lord, the great opportunities that You have made us so rich. So help us to be rich with what You have given us to serve You. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.